Okay, so the okay, so the let's that's uh next session uh for automated crypto analysis. So this session has three talks, and the first talk is a boosting differential linear crypto analysis of Chacha Seven with MLP. Uh, so the Juan Gratis uh, presents the talk, please. Okay, gracias. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, the title of this paper is Boosting Differential Linear Crypto Analysis of Chacha Seven with MILP. This is a paper together with Emmanuel, Emmanuel Bellini, David Gerol, Ruth Macarin, and Tomas Perin. I am Juan Grados, and I will give this talk. So this talk is divided in three. In the first part, we'll do a review of crypto analysis against Chacha. After I will explain uh, the techniques and our uh, implementation that we did to improve the state of the art, um, regarding crypto analysis against Chacha, and finally the conclusions. So regarding the related words, there is this seminal paper by Amazon et al presented at this same conference in 28. They, then uh, they managed to find a um, key recovery attack for Chacha reduced to seven rounds. And the subsequent papers after this paper managed um, only to um, improve the data complexity of the time complexity of this um, attack. So in this paper, we are going beyond these seven rounds for the first time, um, presenting a differential linear distinguishers and also a um, key recovery attack for Chacha. After um, the publication of this paper, we have another other papers, um, for example, this from Wang et al, where they managed also to find a distinguisher, a key recovery attack, sorry, for more than seven rounds. Also, we have this other paper by Day et al, where they managed to improve also and go beyond the seven rounds um, previous distinguishers. So as we know, Chacha was invented by Daniel Bainstein. It is fast in somewhat environment because it used uses uh, uh, modular addition, XOR operations, and rotations. Uh, and due this, its resistance against timing attacks and cache attacks has better diffusion than Salsa, and actually is being used in TLS version 1.3. We have some proposed to use Chacha in uh, Chacha reduced to eight rounds, as for example, that one presented by Amazon et al. in print uh, with title Too Much Crypto. And um, here we would like to highlight then that mm, the community is uh, uh, rich in these eight rounds. Of course, it is uh, in a theoretical way, but it still is a, a point of attention. So Chacha is a string cipher that operates in an initial state. In this initial, initial state, we need to add the, the key. After, we need to apply a 20-round iterated permutation to obtain the final state. And after what we need to do is the modular addition of this initial state with the final state to find the key stream. Here we have two rounds out of 20 of Chacha. And um, this uh, we are representing the Chacha state with a matrix of dimension four by four. And each cell of this um, matrix is, uh, is representing a 32 bit word. And um, there is apply for the third round something that is called a quartan round to every column of this matrix. And after in the second round is apply the same quartan round um, now to the diagonals of this matrix. Okay. Um, something also that is important to mention here that in the initial state where we put the key, um, this is are the places where we need to put the key. That this that are in color uh, in this color violet. So let's move then to the main techniques to do cryptanalysis against Chacha. We have the differential linear attack. In this attack, the attacker aims to divide the cipher in three parts. We have the top part, the middle, and the bottom part. In the top part, uh, the attacker looks for a differential distinguisher. In the middle, for a differential linear distinguisher, and in the bottom part, for a linear approximation. If the top part occurs with probability P, the middle with correlation R, and the um, button with um, correlation Q, then the total correlation is PR 
u squared. If you want to distinguish a cipher from a pseudo-random permutation, then you need to use this quantity of data. So let's move then to the probabilistic neutral bit attack. This is another attack against ChaCha specifically to do key recovery. So one first step to perform uh, this uh, key recovery is something similar to other key recoveries. That is to find a distinguisher. And after that, what we need to do, we need to append some more rounds to our distinguisher. For example, here we are appending two more rounds. And we are appending these two other distinguishers um, to distinguish a distinguisher. Okay, so in key recovery attack, as we know, we need to um, recover the key by guessing the key. Uh, but in this case, as in others as well, we need to use also the inverse of the encryption algorithm of Chacha. The thing is that in Chacha, the key space is so huge, right? it's 2 to the 256. Then um, this technique uh, uh, take, uh, approach this problem. By doing what? By uh, splitting the key space in two parts, we have the part that is in color in color uh, red here, and the other part that is in color uh, green. The part that is in color uh, green is that one that uh, doesn't have effect if you want to distinguish a distinguisher in the key recovery part. And the, the part that is in color red is that one that actually is uh, being used to mount the key recovery. Okay, so the part that is in color Green is called the probabilistic neutral bits, and the other is uh, called the significant bits. So let's move then to our contributions. So regarding to our contributions, we have contributions in the top, in the middle, and in the linear part. Specifically, in, uh, different from previous um, words, in our work, we um, analyze one round differential trace for the top part, starting with two active differences different from other words that they use only one active difference. And why we did this? Because we saw that after one round, the number of active difference is less, pardon, that um, is less than um, the previous word. Specifically, we went from we went from 10 to eight active difference. So this gives an intuition that if we have less active difference, then the subsequent rounds of our differential inner distinguisher will have a slower diffusion. So the pay to, in general, eh, uh, um, the, uh, we need to, 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 pay, to pay a price for this. And the, this was uh, the going from a probability two to the minus five, in, as in previous words, to two to the minus seven. So then um, we have um, explored another things in order to try to improve the top part. As for example, we try to, uh, instead of starting with three active bit difference, we try, um, instead of starting with two active difference, we try to start with three active difference and also we explore two rounds uh, differential trace, but these attempts uh, didn't help to improve the state of the art. So let's skip for now the middle part and let's move on to the um, button part. Uh, regarding the button part, we analyze carefully the formulas of the quartan round and we see that we, co we can obtain <coughs> two rounds for free with correlation one. And then what we did is to fix these two rounds and we take our top, uh, our differential distinguisher with two active bit difference at the beginning. And we uh, analyze what happened in the backward direction for the round uh, 3.5. And we saw that the correlation is 0 0.375. That is not bad at all. Then we set the middle, uh, the middle part in the, at rounds two and three. Then we wanted to uh, compute the correlation of this middle part, but we, we see that after experiments that the correlation was not stable. Then what we did is to try to figure out a way to, to compute or to estimate this correlation. As you can see, after two rounds, the output of every quarter round this one here, are, the output are independent. So then we use the peeling up lemma 
uh, creating four partitions for every uh, for this uh, differential linear distinguisher. So actually, we create four differential distinguishers, and this is one of them. This is the another one, and so on. Then using the Pili up lemma, we estimate the correlation of the middle part. To make sure that uh, we did well, we uh, create uh, new differential linear distinguishers, uh, combining all the possible partitions, and we use experiments to see if this uh, peeling up lemma is estimating well or not uh, uh, the correlations. And what we saw, as you can see in the table, is um, that this peeling up lemma is estimating very well, uh, or is estimating well the, the, the correlation. So then, uh, for the middle part, we obtain or we estimate the correlation with this value here, 2 to the minus 30 dot 15. So we create then this five round differential linear distinguisher, and this is the base for all uh, our results, uh, as, as you as you will see. Then uh, we we extend this five round differential linear distinguisher more to rounds, okay, to reach seven rounds, and we use um, MALP model to do this. So surprisingly, we saw that uh, in the previous attack, nobody used. Uh, MALP models to attack Chacha. So we did that, and we managed to find this uh, good correlation for this uh, linear part. So then the data complexity of the seven round differential uh, distinguishers is this, this value here. Okay. And then uh, we extend this seven round um, differential linear distinguisher more 0 0.5 rounds. Again, we use our MALP model and we obtain this correlation here. And we can construct with this a 7.5 round differential linear distinguisher with this data complexity. Um, so remember, please, this five round differential linear distinguisher, because as I mentioned, this is the base also to construct key recovery attacks. In fact, um, we construct a seven. Uh, round key recovery attack by using the previous distinguisher, this five round differential in the distinguisher, and we append two rounds for the PNB part. So then by using 160 PNBs, we uh, found this data complexity and this time complexity, okay? And, um, but uh, a few uh, time ago, uh, a researcher from China called Chi Shang uh, contact us to to point out that there is a, a flaw in our estimation. We correct this flaw, and uh, this flaw differs only for one bit. We extend this seven round key recovery attack more zero zero uh, dot twenty five round, okay, and we uh, you, we use the same differential linear distinguisher, and now we append two dot five. Uh, 2.25 uh, round, and by using 133 uh, probability neutral bits, we found this data complexity and this da time complexity. Again, we needed to correct this uh, data complexity and time complexity uh, because we are reusing the previous result. So now, uh, after the correction, uh, we are differing from the previous one by only two bits. We have more distinguisher and uh, key recovery attacks in our paper. If you want to see the details of them, you can go and uh, see them. So regarding the comparison with the state of the art at the time of the publication of this paper, we have that we improved the previous uh, seven round differential linear distinguisher for a, a factor more than two to the 40. Okay, and we create a for the first time, we discovered for the first, first time a 7.5 round um, differential linear distinguisher. Regarding the key recovery attack, we managed to improve the previous uh, results at the time of the publication of this paper for approximately 2 to the 14, but we pay a price of 2 to the 20 approximately for the data complexity. Okay, then the conclusions. Um, we improved the best seven rounds attacks presented in the literature, okay, in uh, in distinguishers and also in key recovery attacks. We uh, 
we were the first to go beyond seven rounds. So we, we reached 7.5 rounds uh, for differential linear distinguisher. Um, and this, uh, Results were possible to our exploration of two active bit difference at the beginning of the differential linear distinguisher. And also <clears throat> do that uh, we search for differential and linear approximation uh, by using MALP models. We use uh, we also optimize the good implementation that was used by Coutinho et al at Eurocrip 2021 to improve uh, or to compute the mid, uh, correlation of the middle path. And uh, further, we are uh, studying um, the three state strategy presented at Eurocrit 2022 to increase the number of probabilistic neutral bits, and in this way, reduce uh, the key recovery attack complexity even more. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for our talk. So the, do you have any questions from audience? I have one question. So, uh, I think so. The many uh, existing researchers who are to attack the chacha. So probably so that they first found the uh, differential linear distinguishers for middle part and extend uh, this distinguisher to the differential part and linear part. I think this is a natural well. so natural method, but uh, I think uh, your method, you first find the nice differential first part and uh, nice linear part mm -hmm. and combine yeah. uh, middle part. But of course, we cannot expect middle, we can find nice differential, this linear, di differential linear distinguishers for middle part in this strategy. So what intuition did you have uh, in your method? Yeah. So why you think this method is nice? Okay, so let, let me go back, please, to the... So the first intuition was that the number of active bit difference after one round, uh, starting with two active with two active bit difference, is less than the previous words. So this uh, gives an intuition that uh, the will be a slower diffusion in the subsequent rounds. And the second reason is because for the linear part, we found uh, after analyzing carefully the formulas of the quartan rounds, we found two rounds for free. Then these two things uh, give an intuition that we should start on the sides instead of in the middle. And uh, give, that gives us good results, as you can see. Okay, thanks very much. Thank and you. I also have another question. Yeah. <laughs> so you in maybe in page 35, I think. So you mentioned the uh yes. So the what do you mean the data complexity is a 166.89? Because I think the data complexity is up to the 128. So we cannot prepare such a data in the specification of the chat So I think the maybe nonce and the counter mm -hmm. is the total size of the nonce and counter is 128 bits. Yeah, yeah but this is the version of chat of two to the 256. So the, the, the key space is 256. So you also the active the key. No, 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 no. We are working here in the single key scenario. But uh, how to correct uh, to the 166.89 data? IB and nonce length is only 128 bits. No? Mm. So I think the, uh, the internal state of the cha cha is a uh, 512 mm -hmm. and 128 bits are constant, so attacker cannot control. And the 256 bits are key, and 128 bits are nonsense uh, counter. So I think as the, for the single key scenario, we cannot correct 
more than data, uh, that we cannot collect the data more than two to the 128. Mm. Yeah, I, for now, I don't have an answer for, for, for your question, but uh, I will say that previous words uh, also have more than two to that 128. Okay. Okay. So sorry for, for this. So it's a, just a comparison of their previous yeah. works. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So the next talk. Okay, so the next talk is simplified modeling of meter in the middle attacks for block ciphers, new quantum attacks. Uh, okay. Hello. It's on. I think so. Okay. Okay, okay Andre, please start your talk. Thank you for the introduction. Um, okay, so yes, this is a uh, joint work with Mark Stevens. Um, and it's going to be about meeting the middle attacks or uh, yet another modeling uh, for this uh, session. Um, so we're going to consider this kind of problem. Uh, let's take a block cipher. And the block cipher has many rounds. And the goal is to find an internal state and a key, uh, which uh, are going to satisfy some constraint that relates the uh, input and the output of the block cipher. Uh, so if you present it like this, uh, you have the first internal state, and it goes through. And then at the end, you obtain the, the, the output. And you have some constraints that are called wrapping constraints. That's just because there are two different cases we're interested in. The first one is a key recovery attack, where the constraint is basically you have access to the black box. And so you won't find the key and internal state that match the output of the black box. And this is a constraint that is created between input and output. Uh, but also in some cases, we use the block cipher as a compression function, and we want to find a pseudo preimage, which is relating the input and the output, because we have basically used this as a compression function by XORing the input and output. And so the target preimage here is a relation between the input and output. But both cases are very analogous, uh, and the model we're considering applies to both. Um, so the way we solve this uh, using the meet in the middle principle is we're going to separate this uh, path into two sub subsets. Uh, we're going to uh, define a forward and a backward computational path. And we're going to compute along these two paths completely independently. So we take all the possibilities for the forward path, all the possibilities for the backward path, and we enumerate pairs of path and we keep the ones that are going to match whenever the two paths meet. So you have some points uh, in, the, um, in the designs where the, the paths are, are going to meet, and we are going to use this to um, see if basically the pairs of matching path. And of course, whenever we have a matching uh, a pair that matches, uh, we're going to recompute everything and uh, see if this is the result. This is a broad principle. And now the automatic search of meeting the middle attacks. You can see that the attack is entirely defined by the choice of the backward and forward path. And there is a simple way to define such a set of choices. So um, this can be viewed as an optimization problem. The optimize the attack complexity in the set of choices. And there have been lots of works on this uh, in the recent years. Uh, I'm going to cite the, the one of uh, Bao et al. at Eurocrit 21. Um, because there are many others that improved on this work afterwards. And they basically defined a set of rules that are going to constrain uh, the admissible path, the one that you can use for attacks. And with Mark, we tried to uh, set up a simpler model. So the, the problem is this model is only going to work uh, for a restricted uh, set of designs. And at Crypto22, we worked on permutations. Um, and the work I'm presenting today, we try to expand this at most, at, at most as we could. And so this is going to expand uh, to key schedules, uh, but it's going to be simple key schedules in a sense that we're going to see. 
So um, I'm going to start with explaining the uh, first model, the one without the keys, and then how we add the keys in this model. And uh, hopefully that will mean some time for uh, some applications. So let's start with the keyless model. Um, we're going to consider an SPN design. For simplicity, and in this SPN design, we have the basic operations which are applying S-boxes and doing bit permutations. If you think of present, this is exactly present. Um, but it's going to also to include AES-like ciphers um, with a trick which is to uh, see the composition of S-boxes and mixed columns as a super S-box, just a big S-box. And so between the super S-boxes, this is the AES. Between the super S-boxes, the only operation that remains is a shuffling of the bytes. And so you can see this, see this in the same way. So now you have this design, and it's an undirected graph. And the S-boxes are nodes in this graph, which are related by the uh, permutations of shuffling of bits or nibbles. And I'm just going to define and the notion of width of a node in this graph, so of an S-box. It's just how many bits or nibbles are necessary to compute it. It can go in one direction. For example, you can compute forwards if you know all the four bits of the input. But also, you can compute backwards. And also, if you know two bits in input and two bits in output, uh, then you can compute everything again. A meet in the middle characteristic is defined by a labeling of nodes, which are either forwards or backwards, or nothing, uh, if we don't put them in the path. And we're going to define uh, the list of all as possible assignments to, uh, of values to the nodes in the forward path and the backward path. And uh, finally, we're going to define a list, which simply says uh, the merge list between the two. And this is a list of pairs of paths that match uh, at the matching points. So if you consider this, for example, this is a basic example where uh, I have put two nodes in my backward list and two nodes in my forward list. And I still have edges between them, which are going to reduce uh, the number of possibilities for the matching pairs. The attack complexity entirely depends only on the sizes of the forward, backward, and merge lists. Uh, if you consider classically, uh, what you can do is you compute the entire forward list, and then you compute the entire backward list, but you just go through the elements and uh, see if there are some that match uh, um, the, the, the elements you have in the forward list. So you only use classical memory to store the forward list, and then you just go through it and then enumerate all the solutions. So this is the complexity that it gives you. We're also interested in quantum attacks. But quantum attacks here are only using Grover's search algorithm to accelerate some steps. And the step to accelerate is the second one. So we still construct the forward list. But now to look for the solution, we simply have to uh, transform this into a search problem. This is a search problem. We're searching for an element in the backward or merge list that matches. And so we use Grover's search on that. So we have a well-known square root speedup. Uh, the memory that is still the same because we still need to store the forward list. Now, um, now we're going to go into the MILP modeling. So we use MILP, uh, and as uh, Marie explained it this morning, this is uh, optimization linear, under linear constraints and possibly uh, discrete variables. Um, the forward nodes are the discrete variables. The, the forward and backward nodes, so the choice of these nodes are the discrete variables, so they are Boolean variables. And now you can see that the size of the forward, uh, backward, and all, all the lists, basically, are only uh, determined by the choice of these nodes. Because you're going to take the total width of forward nodes, this is the uh, total number of possibilities, and reduce this by the number of edges that are between them. In my example, uh, the previous one, if you take the backward list, works the same. Um, you have two to the four possibilities uh, for the first node and two to the four possibilities for the second one, but you have also one edge between them. So it's two to the four times two to the three. And in log two, this gives you simply this expression, which is completely linear and defined by linear constraints. So the MILP modeling strategy is simply to define this choice of nodes and then deduce everything from it all the list sizes, and since we have the list sizes, you did use the complexity, and this is your objective. Um, a little can be said about super S boxes, because uh, we're, we're having a lot of super S boxes in there, and they behave a bit differently. Uh, when you have a super S box, like in the AES, you can know some edges in input and output, and you can still, you, you can still have a matching from that. 
even though you don't have an edge that connects the input and the output like before. And the reason is that the mix kernels that is inside is a linear operation. And for example, for ES, whenever you know more than four inputs and outputs to a mix kernels, you can have, uh, in that case, C minus four amounts of matching. You can write linear relations uh, between these inputs and outputs, and this works the same. So the modeling also has to handle that, and it does. OK, so now I'm going to uh, explain to you how we can extend this to key schedules. And it's actually going to be very simple. Um, we keep the same, first of all, we keep the same modeling as before. But now, in the block cipher, we have keys. That's the usual, like most block ciphers have keys. Um, and these keys, they can be XORed on any edge. So uh, we keep the same operations as before, but now the edges in this graph can be basically labeled by keys. And the key nibbles, they come, from, they come to us from a key schedule algorithm. So what we do is simply, we still color the key nibbles. That's uh, going to, this is going to give us a very nice drawing later. And uh, we color them either in forwards, so blue, backwards, or, or shared. So shared uh, is basically meaning that uh, we, we, these are key that we know in both paths. Uh, it's a bit different than, uh, than before, but it still works in a, in a very similar way. So the forward key are the ones that are going to be counted in the forward list. So in the forward list now, you don't only have um, values for the internal state path, but also for the key that we put in there. And the backward key they are going to be counted in the backward list. And the shared ones, where they always, they're always known, either in the backward and forward. So just uh, depending on the case, you just fix them, or you have to loop on the possible values for them. Um, that's the key variables. How do we model the key schedule? Um, and this is where these, these things are going to be restricted. Because the operations we handle for the key schedule are the same that we handled for the state path. And in state path, we only had S boxes and uh, bit permutations. So in the case schedule, we only want S boxes and bit permutations. Uh, that still models a whole bunch of ciphers, including present, but unfortunately not the AES anymore because it has very complicated case schedule. Well, with complicated linear operations that are not permitted here. So we only support S boxes permutations, and uh, we compute new key nibbles using S boxes and permutations, and then we select some of them. Um, these operations are simply modeled a bit like before by relations between the variables. So uh, you can say, for example, if I have four uh, key bits that are obtained by applying an S-box to four key bits, then I have a relation that says, okay, if I know four of these key bits, then all of them are known as well. So if uh, I put four of them in the backward list, then all of them can be put in the backward list. It goes the same. So these are the kind of relations that we include in the model. And what about the state path? Because at some point, the key nibbles are going to be added in the path, and we have to model that. Um, actually, this, this is pr practically the simplest uh, modeling that, uh, that we have. Um, we're simply going to model this via constraints. And the reason uh, is, um, is, is an optimization reason. You can see that um, if you have two nodes in the path, that are connected, and you have a kinney ball that is added in there. Um, and if you don't know the kinney ball, if you want to compute uh, alongside this forward pass in this example, you need to guess a state nibble instead. And guessing a state nibble is costly. It would be a better idea to just guess the kinney ball here, because it goes the same. They have the same size. And uh, if you guess a kinney ball, you can hope to reuse it somewhere else. So basically, um, it's very difficult to see because blue and, and black are a bit uh, the same color in, in this drawing. But uh, having um, a key that you don't know inside the path is never a good idea for you. So it's a better idea to guess it, so to know it inside the path, and then to, uh, to be able to compute forwards in this example, but also backwards uh, in the other case. So this is simply a constraint whenever I have a kidney board on an edge, and I have the two sets, uh, two nodes that are related to the same color, then it must be of the same color as well. And we just put these constraints, and uh, the model is going to find us uh, acceptable 
coloring for the for the key nibbles. This is a basic constraint. It has to be adapted for the case of super S boxes. I'm not going to uh, enter all these details. Um, and since we are adding keys, now we can target the key recovery case. And as I said a bit uh, during this presentation, the key recovery differs from the pre-image case in uh, very subtle ways. Uh, or maybe not those subtle, because in the pre-image case, there are many solutions with different keys. You're just looking for a key and a state which uh, have these matching constraints between the input and output. But in the key recovery case, you know that there is only one key, because that's uh, the secret key you're looking for. So uh, there is a difference here in which, for example, in the pre-image case, we can fix some parts of the key. Uh, but in the key recovery case, you can't do that. You're going to have to loop on all these possibilities for these parts of the key. So all the keys must be explored. And it changes just a bit the constraints in the model. There is also something uh, about how you put the constraint between the input and the output, so the wrapping that I put in my first drawing. Um, when, you have, uh, when you're going through, basically, when you're doing the key recovery attack, you have to go through the cipher at some point. You have to make queries to the cipher. And this is modeled by the wrapping constraint to just add in there a very big node which models going through the cipher. So uh, for example, if you compute the forward path or the backward path, at some point, you're going to go through the cipher and go back to the, uh, the beginning. And this also allows you to control the data complexity. OK. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about, about applications of this. And I'm going to focus only on one application, uh, kind of the best one uh, for this model, that's Saturna. Um, it's an AES-like block cipher with 256-bit blocks and keys. And the nibbles here, there are 16 of them. And, I mean, this is one of the presentations of the block cipher. And in this presentation, the nibbles are 16 bits. And it looks like this. The key schedule is very simple. It alternates between the key and a rotated version of it. And uh, you have super S boxes, and then uh, shuffling of the bytes of the nibbles, and then super S boxes, et cetera. Now, um, these are some results on pseudo pre-image attack. So um, Saturna was used as a block cipher, and also the block cipher was used in a hash function. So it makes sense to target this. Um, and this is the pseudo pre-image attack constraint. So um, in a work of, of Dong et al. at Crypto21, they, uh, they looked at this, and they found an attack on seven rounds uh, out of 16, and with a time 208. And this was already an automatic model. So now this is, uh, there is a better attack with this automatic model, much higher memory, but uh, we can improve the time complexity just a bit, and also include a new quantum attack. And since I don't have lots of time, I just uh, have a drawing here. Um, no PhD students were harmed to produce this figure. It was automatically generated. Don't worry. You can just see on this that this is what the model returns. It just chooses some nodes to put in the backward forward path, and then uh, colors the key nibbles accordingly. And uh, this already allows you to deduce the complexity of the attack. So just to conclude, um, this, in this work, we, we did a very simple uh, model for meeting the middle attacks. But of course, it only works on simple ciphers. They have to um, have these simple key schedules. Uh, but it's very fast when it's applicable. It runs on a laptop in a couple of minutes. Um, and it allows us to have some results on, your, on lightweight designs, uh, for example, Saturna. And the main open question would be, of course, to find the best way to model everything with a simple, um, with a simple model. But I'm not sure how to do that, uh, because key schedules like AES create very complicated renormations, and it's difficult to handle all of them in a single modeling. Um, yes, so you can find the code here, and the paper is, of course, uh, on the web. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for our talk. So do you have any questions? Uh yeah, maybe. Uh just to just for yeah, to to clarify a bit. Um you talked a lot about uh key nibbles. Does that mean that your model assumes that yeah, you always guess an entire nibble at a time and you also when you do the matching, you do it um uh, based on nibbles. So Let's say because, for example, in present, it might be that uh, you know some output bits are actually a quadratic function, uh, 
uh, of the input with only a single. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you don't see that. No. In prison, the nibbles are only single bits, so you are at the bit level, uh, but you don't see the quadratic okay. uh, linear relations. Yeah, and do you have any plans to extend your tool to take into account that information? Uh, I don't have plans to do that, but it would be a good idea. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Um, can can you go back to like one of the early slides where you discussed the uh, complexity uh, of the attack? Maybe yeah, one that one. This one. Yeah, uh, the one after. Yes. Uh, no, the no. one before. So the one before arms. Yeah, that one. Yes. Okay. Um, so you have these two parts to your attack. Yes. Do they, so here you model this kind of like both of them have equal weight or they they're kind of take the same time complexity. Is this like, is this a correct assumption or is it maybe better to like add some small uh, factor to each of the two parts of your component? Because you, you then you would get um, like a trade-off curve between the two, depending on what is more uh, uh, time consuming to so compute. I, um, I'm not sure. So. Basically, all trade-offs are possible because uh, for the model, the only thing you constrain is, uh, OK, I have this first part, which cost me the entire uh, forward list or the backward if you swap them, uh, the forward list size. And then I have the second part, which cost me the backward list pa size and so on. And you just uh, constrain that you want your whole complexity, so the maximum of this, to be uh, smaller than, uh, well, you want it to be minimized. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and you can also put, uh, you can also do trade-offs and say, I want the memory complexity to be smaller than this. Or I also want it to be minimized. Uh, things like this. I'm not sure if this answers your question. Yeah. So, so did you explore like these trade-off curves, or uh, I didn't. Ex I mean, we didn't explore the entire trade-off curves, kind of. But you can observe things. Like, uh, for example, there. It, I didn't put all the details here, but the memory complexity can go can be very very small at some points. And this also helps for quantum attacks because in this formula, you can see that the term that is responsible for the memory complexity is actually more important in the quantum setting than it is in the classical setting. So the memory efficient attacks also help you in the quantum setting. Yeah. yeah thanks. Okay. So thank you very much for the talk. Hello, everyone. OK, so the final talk of this session is improved search for integral impossible differential and the correlation tax. So Hossein have to present the talk. Thank you, Yusuke, for introduction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk. Uh, this is a joint work with Simon Gerhalter, Sadar Sadari, and Maria Aisha Sida. So I'm going to present our tool to find the complete attack, complete integral impossible differential and zero correlation attack. And by complete, I mean uh, the full Kirikari attack, including the time memory complexity, a time memory data complexity valuations. To achieve this goal, we first improved our CP-based method from Eurocrypt 2023 uh, from two aspects. We removed some of its limitations, and we also extended it to a bitwise uh, model to be able to apply it to weakly aligned designs like OSCON as well. Origin originally, it was proposed for a strongly aligned designs. And as a third major contribution of this work, we introduced a CP-based uh, method for partial sum technique uh, for the first time. Partial sum technique is the main key recovery technique for integral attacks. And this CP model for partial sum technique can be combined with our CP model for distinguisher to build a unified model for finding the complete integral attack. So we applied it to several black ciphers, and we provided a series of improved results. Just to give you an intuition about the amount of results in this paper, we provided 25 new distinguishers for several black ciphers, as well as 24 complete Kirikari attacks for different black ciphers. For example, this table represents only part of our results regarding distinguishers. As you can see, we improved the integral distinguisher of Karma, Karma V2 uh, by seven rounds. 
And what is not represented in this table is the running time of, of, our, of our tool. Our tool can find these results in a few seconds running on a standard laptop. And this table represents only part of our results for key recovery. And as you can see, for example, we improved the integral key recovery on two variants of a skinny by one round. So let me tell you the story of this work and how we achieved these results. First, let's briefly review the background of this work. Um, the idea of integral attack is essentially providing a set of plain text uh, whose corresponding ciphertext sum to zero. This way we can distinguish it from a random permutation. The idea of the possible differential attack is completely different. It exploits a differential transition with probability zero, namely an impossible differential trail. And the idea of zero correlation attack is actually the dual of impossible differential distinguisher in the context of linear, linear analysis. But these attacks, as you can see, have been discovered at different times independently, and they seem completely different, right? What brings them under the same roof is are some nice links, uh, one of which is the technique that uh, we use to find these distinguishers, which is the same technique under the name of miss in the middle technique. The idea of missing the middle is, uh, for example, for impossible differential, is finding two differences such that when you propagate forward and backward with probability one, they contradict each other in the middle. This shape represents the six rounds of S skinny block cipher. We represent this box by SC, and the remaining operations are clear from the shape. Choose these two input output differences. Assume that red represents non zero difference. White represents zero and blue represents any difference, zero or unzero, don't care, unknown, right? And let's keep propagating the forward and backward with probability one. If we do it several steps, you will see that they contradict each other in S step number three, I mean uh, X3. Uh, for example, the first cell should be zero, should have a zero difference based on the upper trail, and it should have a non zero difference based on the lower trail, which is impossible, right? It's exactly the same as proof by contradiction in mathematics in logic. So we call it missing the middle technique. Using this technique, we can also find zero correlation distinguishers. Just apply this propagation rule for linear mask, okay? So we have a technique to find impossible differential and zero correlation distinguisher. But how we can find integral distinguisher? In crypto 2015, a nice uh, link between zero correlation and integral attack was uncovered. And it essentially says, any zero correlation distinguisher for binary field block ciphers can be converted to integral distinguisher. But how we can do it, I can explain by a simple example. This shape represents six round zero correlation distinguisher for a skinny. You have this input activeness pattern and this uh, output activeness pattern. Just invert the input activeness pattern. As you can see, for example, if if you want to convert it to integral distinguisher, this is a zero correlation distinguisher. If you want to convert it to integral distinguisher, uh, we activate all of the white cells at the input and we choose a fixed value for the blue cells, just the converse of this activeness pattern, right? Then the XOR of active linear, uh, active uh, cells at the output will have a zero sum property. So this way we can convert zero correlation to integral uh, distinguisher, right? And now we have uh, one technique to discover three distinguishers, right? But distinguisher is only the first step of uh, finding a complete uh, key recovery attack. We typically uh, extend the distinguisher at both ends to identify the like uh, involved keys, which, has, which keys should be guessed. And these keys might be related through the key schedule. Overall, finding a key recovery is a very hard combinatorial optimization problem. And that's why there have been many research to automate this process. But what is the research gap? The research gap is here uh, that uh, all of the previous CP-based methods to automate uh, this process are based on satisfi unsatisfiability of the CP model. For example, if you want to find the impossible differential distinguisher based on the Eurocrypt uh, 2017 uh, paper, which is a very nice uh, paper by Yosuke uh, Todo and Yu Sasaki, you essentially first model the propagation of differential trails as usual, and then you fix the input output difference and call the solver to see if the model is satisfiable or not. If it is unsatisfiable, you will have an impossible differential distinguisher. 
right? But the problem is that you are fixing the input-output difference. When you fix the input-output uh, the input-output differences, you cannot extend uh, this model to a unified optimization problem for key recovery, all right? This is the gap. In our Eurocrypt paper, we uh, introduced a model based on satisfiability to find distinguishers. It's based on uh, missing email technique. To do that, uh, let's say we want to find impossible differential distinguisher for black cipher E. We divide it into two parts, upper and lower. We model the propagation of the uh, truncated trail forward through the like upper part, EU. We do it by a CP model, right? And we model the propagation of the deterministic trace backward for the second part. It's an independent CP model. And then we put some constraints for the meeting point to guarantee the contradiction between these two propagations. And finally, we put all of these constraints into one model. And when you solve this model, any, solu any feasible solution of this model is essentially an impossible differential distinguisher. And there is no constraints on the input and output. It's very nice. It can be extended to unified model for key recovery as we did in Eurocrypt 2023, but it has a limit. We are fixing the location of contradiction. You see the red part. We are defining the location of contradiction up to a, a like in the level of rounds. In this work, we resolve this limitation. The idea is very simple. Instead of uh, propagating the deterministic trace halfway, we model the propagation of deterministic trace through the whole distinguisher, namely RD rounds, as you can see in the right shape. We also model the deterministic propagation um, backward through the whole distinguisher. And then we put a constraint to guarantee having contradiction in at least one cell through the whole distinguisher. This way, the solver locates the best position for the contradiction, depending on your objective function. Right? So this, this again, has another limit. Uh, our model was originally proposed for strongly aligned black ciphers. So another uh, contribution of this work is that we extend it to the bitwise or weakly aligned designs also. To do, so, to do so, we essentially should uh, model the propagation of truncated trails or deterministic trails in the level of bits. I give you the idea for uh, black for uh, sparks, but you, this idea can be extended for any building block operations like XOR and branch. We just, uh, for, for example, for differential, we just look at the DDT and we identify all of the deterministic uh, differential transitions like this. Uh, the question mark here represents uh, unknown. It means the difference in the corresponding position can be zero or one. Uh, once we identify all of these deterministic transitions, we define some CP variables together with CP constraints to model these propagations. The idea is very simple. For each bit position in the cipher, we define an integer variable which can take 0, 1, or minus 1. Minus 1 again means unknown. Then we define some simple CP constraints to essentially model the propagation of deterministic transitions. It can be for differential or linear. Now we have a model to identify impossible differential zero correlation and integral distinguisher for weakly aligned designs like OSCON. We applied it to OSCON, and this here represents the distinguishers that we discovered for OSCON. And as you can see, in only by only sol by solving only one instance of our model, we can identify to the power of 155 distinguishers because it's a truncated distinguisher, right? It's not uh, like previous tools when we fix the input-output difference. This is uh, the advantage of our tool. Now we are done with the distinguisher, right? We have, a we have a CP model based on satisfiability for identifying distinguishers, right? The main advantage is that it can be extended to a unified model for key recovery. And when we have uh, a model to, which is extendable for key recovery, we can also consider some of the key recovery techniques like meeting the middle, key bridging, and partial sum technique. In our Eurocrypt paper, we um, actually provide a method to model meeting the middle and key bridging. Here, I want to present a partial sum technique. Uh, but what's the basic idea of uh, partial sum technique? Uh, in integral key recovery, assume that you have a zero sum property for x, which is an intermediate variable in the cipher, right? 
you append, you typically append some rounds after the distinguisher and it start from the ciphertext and get some key to drive uh, X and check the zero sum property. This is the story, right? If you want to do it in a naive approach, assuming that we have a, a pool of ciphertext of size N, for each ciphertext, you should guess key and uh, do the decryption, right? So that the complexity of naive approach is N times to the power of K. But the idea of partial sum technique is a splitting the decryption process into some smaller operations and then driving the required intermediate states a step by step. But the advantage lies in the fact that if you start from the ciphertext as it is visualized in its shape, the gray part, if you start from the ciphertext, as you approach to the target cell, namely X, the number of data that you should process decreases. Look at the gray part the number of data that you should process decreases, right? Let me give you a basic example for integral attack on AES. It represents the integral attack on six rounds of AES. Uh, you have a distinguisher for four rounds, and if you query like two to the power of 32 uh, suitable plain text with this activity pattern, you have balanced property in all of the bytes after four rounds. You append two rounds after the distinguisher, and you perform six rounds key recovery. But assume that you want to drive the first cell of C4. As you can see, five bytes of the key are involved, right? So the complexity of naive approach is two to the power of 32 times to the power of 40. And due to the fact that each zero sum property provides uh, eight bit filter, you should repeat this process six times to be able to uniquely retrieve the master key. So the complexity is roughly two to the power of 74. This is the complexity of naive approach. Keep it in mind. Let's see what's the complexity of partial sum, okay? To the power of 74. The complexity of partial sum is to the 52, but how? This uh, shape visualizes the partial sum technique. You start, uh, if you look at the labels on each cell, the label represents the step number in which you process that cell, right? So typically we start from the ciphertext side and we guess some keys and we drive some internal state. We store them, and then we again guess another key, and we process this intermediate data that we have stored, right? If you look at the right shape, you see, for example, we start from uh, decrypting to the power of 32 ciphertext by guessing two bytes of the key. But the number of data, I mean, the number of possible possible values that the intermediate values can take is two to the power of 24 because you should store essentially three, three bytes. Look at the second step. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know how to point, but anyways, it's clear, right? In the second step, for the third step, you should process to the power of 24 data that you have already stored. So as you can see, uh, when, you approach to, when you approach the target cell, the number of data that you should process is getting smaller and smaller. And uh, as you can see, the complexity of each step is uh, roughly to the power of 48. So there are four steps and you should repeat this for six times as before. The complexity will be six times, four times to the power of 48, which is to the power of 52 S box evaluation, right? So uh, let me briefly tell you how we model this very complicated step-by-step uh, -step case and determine procedure. This shape represents uh, our key recovery, our partial sum uh, key recovery for five rounds of a skinny. And as you can see, uh, it is a step-by-step -step case and determine uh, procedure. This table represents the detail of procedure, but if you look at the labels on each cell in the shape, the label represents in which step we are processing the corresponding cell, right? Typically, we start from the ciphertext side. And uh, before that, all of the blue cells here represents the involved cells that you need to drive the value of x13, the first cell of x13, right? You want to drive the first value of x13, which has a zero sum property. You start from the ciphertext, you get some keys, you store the intermediate values, then you get another key, you process the intermediate values, okay? But um, as you can see, the main thing that we should uh, know to be able to like evaluate the time complexity of partial sum technique here is exactly these labels. Namely, 
knowing in which step we should process the data. If we know in which step we should process each cell, then we can determine everything else, the time, data, memory complexity. Look at the table. If you have these numbers on each cell, you have everything else. So we need, we need to model this, right? This step assignment procedure. So for, to do that, we define, uh, like, we assume that in each step of process some technique, we are guessing at least one byte of the key, which is a completely natural assumption. Then we define the number of steps, namely S, which can be uh, actually the number of involved key cells. And then for each cell in the key recovery, we define an integer variable which specifies the S-step number of this cell, the S-step number in which we are processing, right? This is a variable in our CP model. And then we define some constraints to model the propagation of this S-step assignment. You can refer to the paper to see more details how we define the constraints, but this is a very overall, uh, I mean, big picture of what we do. Once we have this CP model for the partial sum technique, we put, uh, we, we put it together with our CP model for distinguisher part. And we have an objective function, which is minimizing the total time complexity. This shape represents the like a black box uh, view of our tool. You need to specify only the number of rounds that you want to attack. You call this uh, the tool and it gives you the complete attack like this. All you need for key recovery, essentially you don't need to any, do anything else you have the complete attack, including time, memory, data, complexity evaluation. So this is the end of my talk, where I'm going to uh, point to the, some of the future works. Of course, our model for distinguisher is based on satisfiability, but it cannot capture all of the contradiction. Compared to the user secure method, it has a disadvantage, dis 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 right? So one of the uh, other future works could be resolving this limit, namely capturing indirect contradictions, right? Another future work could be extending our method for ARX and analog ciphers, and also extending our method to division property and monomer prediction, because division property and monomer prediction are also based on like unsatisfiability. If we can convert them to a like, satisfiability-based problem, we can take advantage of extending to this to a key recovery part. Another future work could be improving our CP model for zero correlation attack. The source code of our tool is publicly available, and I thank you for listening this talk. Before I finish, I would just like to thank you, uh, Xavier Bonetten and uh, Virginia Lademo uh, for very nice communication. They privately communicated us and they found a flaw in one of our assumptions for related key impossible differential attack. We admitted their uh, discovery and I really want to appreciate for a very nice communication that they had. And we acknowledge this uh, flaw in our uh, paper. Uh, this flaw mostly affects the memory complexity of our attacks. But fortunately, the attacks remain valid. I really appreciate them for very nice communication and thanks for listening. Thank you very much. So the time is limited. So the, if you have some quick questions, so the, I want to accept. Okay. Uh, about your last point there about improving the key recovery uh, parts, uh, did you? Take a look at the FFT methods as an alternative for partial sums or in uh, combination. That's a good question. Uh, actually, no, no, we didn't model the FFT technique. FFT is also a very powerful technique for key correct integral attack. We did it in one of our previous works that Mario also presented today morning, but we couldn't integrate it into this tool. Maybe, yeah, it could be one of the future works also. And that, but that's not what you meant with this last point, or. I mean, which improvements did you have in mind for the? Oh, for the, for example, for. Exactly, which attack uh, for integral? Yeah, I mean, you had zero correlation. For zero correlation, yeah. For zero correlation, actually, in this work, we made the integral attack completely automatic. Uh, in our previous works, we made impossible differential attack completely automatic. But zero correlation, we cannot claim that our tool can find the optimum attack. It's very lossy. And it, it, there is a large room for improvement. Actually, for zero correlation, the main difference between zero correlation key recovery and integral key recovery is that in zero correlation, you need to switch between the back, like before and after the distinguisher. But in integral, we typically just append some rounds after the distinguisher. We don't need to switch between. So it will be a harder problem, I would say. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Too. Yep.
ਸੀ